Welcome to the Financing Simplified Podcast with Anthony Venuto. If you're looking for answers to your financial questions, let Anthony and his network of friends and associates answer regular questions that regular people have about their money. Thanks for tuning in. It's time to start simplifying your finances. Welcome back to our Financing Simplified Podcast. And as usual, we definitely want to talk about different perspectives in the market right now. Today, I am honored to bring in Anthony Conte, real estate agent in the area and have a conversation about what we see happening and obviously talking about some really important things. So Anthony, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what got you into the industry, you know, what, what you're seeing happening right now, what, whatever, whatever's on your mind, as you know, these are free flowing conversations, no script, take it away. All right, man. Yeah. So uh, thank you for having me. First of all, um, I've been in the real estate game since end of 2020. So almost a full four years now. Um, kind of a long backstory, you know, after high school, went through went through some extra schooling at, at, at Humber College and, uh, you know, then went into the trades a little bit, then realized, you know, what am I doing? I'm a people's person. I should be here sitting at a table talking to you instead of, uh, you know, running wires uh, in electrical. So um, got my license kind of during COVID. It was a little bit up and down because things closed down. And then finally, once we opened back up, got my full license. And yeah, so now almost four years in this game. And uh, it's been a roller coaster, to say the least, considering with uh, everything we've seen, right? I can imagine. And that's that's actually a really good segue to talk about, like, as someone that's gone into the industry over the last, let's say, a couple of years, you got to see some of the highs. And obviously, now we're yeah. going through the lows. Tell us a little bit about like what you see happening right now. Like first, actually, first question I have for you is how has the uh, education system for realtor changed? Like you got it, you said during COVID. During COVID, yeah. How long was that program? Yeah, so I, I actually was very fortunate because I got in right before they changed it to the new way, which is going through Humber College. And um, you have to do all that extra schooling, all those, all those big, big long-term tests and stuff like that. The way I did it was the old way where it was all done through, I believe it was uh, Aurea and Rico and all that stuff. And uh, I believe it was only like six exams you had to take, uh, basically study for all those, take the exam, move on and, and all that kind of stuff and then do an elective. So uh, from what I've heard now, it is definitely a longer process than, than the way it was before. Before you could bang it out, you know, every, honestly, every couple of weeks, however long you felt you could have done it. Now it's more longer pace because I think they are trying to slow down the amount of, I guess, realtors that, that come into the space because there is so many of us, right? Um, but but yeah, so very fortunate to do it the old way. I don't think I would have wanted to do it the new way. Um, so it's a big deterrent, you think, like it's trying to sort of collapse uh, people from sort of just saying, hey, I'm going to get my license yeah. just for the sake of having because obviously we've heard in the news over the last little while, there's about an exodus of 45,000 realtors. I think it was just in Ontario. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I'm assuming that that would be probably uh, part timers and those individuals that probably weren't producing. And, you know, the stats are funny because they always say like 20 percent of the business or sorry, 80 percent of the business is done by 20 percent of, of the agents. And I think there was like some agents that didn't even do any transactions last yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think what I like about what the real estate game is doing is making the barrier to entry uh, a lot more challenging. Yeah. And I, I wish I would actually pray that they do that in the mortgage industry as well, because of the amount of fiduciary duty, the amount of trust that a client's putting in your hands to make this transaction it shouldn't be just left to somebody that doesn't know or they're just there to chase a check, right? Yeah. I, I believe like agents, even brokers, a lot of them have a passion for this. Some don't, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Like they call a spade a spade. But when you, when you have that duration, you have to really want to do something. It's like going through that education process. And I really think that's important. But ultimately right now, when you're looking at that market, you were, we're talking off camera, you know, there's a couple of transactions happening. I still think the market is active. Yeah. It's yeah. definitely starting to get its uh, winds are starting to happen in behind the sales. They're pushing yeah. people to get into the market. I think a lot of people, and I want to get your thoughts on, I think with more Canadians, you think more Canadians that are looking at the real estate game, they're following the bank of Canada. Like, do you have this conversation? Absolutely. When I tell you, like it is very, 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 a lot of people are living and dying by what the bank of Canada says right now. So you, you're going to see, the minute they drop that rate, right now people are itching. The spring's coming around. You're seeing the sun outside. 
always around this time of year in the spring, people have that itch. People want to, they want to move, they want to buy something, they want to do something, right? Now, once you're going to see the Bank of Canada rate drop, I think it's just going to amplify that even more. Right now, we're seeing a lot of people front loading it, yeah. which means they're getting, trying to get in before, right? But right now, what are you seeing with inventory? Like in the sense, like is inventory picking back up? What are you, what are you finding? Yeah, so what you just said, I wanted to touch in, like, let's say that 900, 800 to maybe 1.2, 1.3 mark, you're actually starting to see a bidding wars coming back. And that's what I've noticed lately, um, especially on those lower price point homes. And, and I'm even starting to see some agents listing at that price purposely trying to get a bidding war. Mm -hmm. um, so there was just a kind of a, a deal I was kind of working on through with my clients and... Uh, you know, it ended up going into a bidding war and there was six offers on the table. And that's something I haven't heard for, for quite a while. Um, and the, the house ended up selling for 200K over asking mm -hmm. price, right? Uh, bringing me back all the way to 2021, it feels like with, with that type of uh, language. But yeah, I, I think you're going to start to see pretty mm -hmm. soon a lot more inventory might, might start to, to change because if this influx of buyers comes in, I don't think we're still at that point yet where we have that inventory that can handle that influx of buyers. And that's where you're just going to see again, exactly what we went through a couple of years ago, where it was, you know, not a lot of inventory, but a lot of buyers and bidding wars came. Right. I, I do agree with you. And I think there's a lot of buyers. There's a lot of pent up demand. There's a lot of people yeah. out there that think, Hey, there are, there's not enough buyers or, Oh, just wait. Mortgages are going to default. You're yeah, going to see yeah, this yeah. huge influx yeah, yeah. of uh, homes in the market. We'll touch upon that in just a minute, but you brought up a really good point that I really want to clarify for our viewers and I see I think there's always a misconception here when you see those over asking signs right so when you're when they're listing home obviously it's a tactic and I, I'm going to caveat this because I think it's a very important comment eventually the buyer will become a seller yeah that buyer is obviously chasing the lowest price you know they're trying to be aggressive but eventually one day when that person who bought the home decides to sell and make the move to another one they're going to want top dollar for the house. Of course. So it's always like, I want, you know, I want that house. I want it cheap. And then when you want to sell, it's like, I want the most, I want the best. So it's a tactic. And ultimately, as I said, whether you agree with it or not, eventually when you're the seller, you want the most price. So when you're listing that house, when you list it, let's say 200K, it sells for 200K over ask. A lot of our viewers, they, they look at a house, they'll call me and say, Ant, I saw this house for $900,000. And I'm looking at that listing. And I'm like, mm -mm, that's not 900 grand. That's 1.2. Yeah. That's 1.150 all yeah. day long. So the difference is, explain the difference between what you're listing it for and what yeah. the market is telling you. Clients need to understand that. Maybe you can break that down a little bit more. Yeah. So, I mean, exactly what you said is I've been through that movie a million times, right? Where it's my client will call me up at the, on a house Sigma. I saw this for, you know, a million bucks, but I don't even need to go into detail without looking at it and saying, they're trying to shoot up. They're trying to get multiple offers, right? And and that's something we did see for for pretty much the entire, let's say, 2021 going into 2022. That's kind of where things were. Mm -hmm. um, basically, what it is, is it's a tactic done, I would say, in, in cohesion with the realtor and, and the homeowner trying to, to, to shoot the price up, right? Because when you see a price that low, the first thing you're going to do, you're going to ask your mortgage your agent, you're going to ask your realtor, hey, what do you think about this? How come it's so low? You know, you think we could get a deal on it, right? Then what ends up happening is, you know, you'll go see the property. Maybe you'll even fall in love with the property. And when it comes to, let's say, offer night, that's the biggest thing. Everyone's, you know, hosting offer night. Um, that's when it's, oh, I really like the house. You know, let's put in an offer. You put in an offer. We put in an offer. Four other people are putting in an offer, right? What's end up going to happen? What's going to happen is they're going to use each offer they get and come back to you and say, hey, we just got this, you know, you, you think you could come up, you know, hey, we just got this, you think you can come up, and eventually people are going to come mm -hmm. up. Some people may, may pull back and say, no, you know what, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that, but some people are going to come up, and what's going to happen? You're going to raise the price, raise the price, raise the price, eventually till you get to the point where the seller is, oh, perfect, we got our price we want, and more. Mm -hmm. There we go, we're happy. Right? Because I think there's a lot of times like we're working with our agents to say like, what are the comparables? What is the actual sale price? Because I think there's a lot of individuals out there that may be watching saying, yeah, but why are they doing that? Like, why don't they just list the home at the price that they want? Right. And that's the conversation that we're having. It's like, I don't know. I, ultimately, eventually, when you're down there, you're trusting your agent to get you the top dollar yeah. on that home. 
you're going to want it, the tactic that's going to get you the most amount of money. So don't look at it as like they're trying to, you know, sneak one by you. Yeah. Ultimately, as I said to you right at the beginning, eventually the buyer becomes the seller and the seller is going to want top dollar. So position yourself in that, in that manner. Now, I don't know if you heard about this and I'm, I, I just said, it's just interesting. There's been this conversation around the WhatsApp chat. I don't know if you saw this where they, the guy was trying to reach out to other people to put in an offer and pay them five, 600 bucks uh, to put in like a, a fake offer. And I found this really interesting. I don't know if you, if you heard no, about that. No, I know. That. I haven't heard about that. Yeah. So it's like been going around right now yeah. where like there's a snap, like a screenshot yeah, yeah, yeah. of this, of this person. And I'm not going to say nationality or where course, it's coming from. Yeah. We'll leave that to our viewers' imaginations. <laughs> uh, but ultimately they're saying, you know, like putting in this, this multiple offer and, and what direction do you think the real estate market or the real estate associations should be going or taking? Uh, I'm assuming you may or may not know. I think a lot of people do about the lawsuits that are happening in the U.S. with all this uh, real estate stuff that's happening with the sale yeah, yeah, yeah. and the commissions and the agents. You think there's a big change coming through the real estate industry in the next little while? Uh, it's it's tough to say because really it's been this way with these you know uh, blind bidding almost because you really don't know what you're going up against for for quite a while right mm -hmm. so to see a change in that i don't know if it's going to come in the the near future you know it's it's very tough to kind of predict but i do think they were talking about something where you know when an offer is coming in you know you'll be able to know what's going on i don't know if that was was passed if that's happening but um i don't know that would be very interesting because i think that would kind of kibosh almost this whole bidding war mm -hmm. situation because if i know what you're going at you know i think already you can kind of have an idea because if you're priced out if you know what you're going at i'm not going to probably come in mm -hmm. or what could happen is on the other side you can see maybe you know what oh okay you know i can't afford that house if that guy is only bidding that much I'll, I'll go above and then you know see where it kind of goes right interesting enough we did have open bidding in the sense i think it was back before my time yeah obviously i was much younger where you could see the offers of what was being presented but I think they removed it because it was like a pissing competition. Because yeah. now it's like, oh, that guy went in five grand over. I'm going to go in seven grand over yeah, or five, yeah, yeah, yeah. six grand over. Yeah. And then it's just like, oh, yeah, okay, well, I'm going to. So ultimately, is it is it is blind bidding one of those things where it's going to be a problem? Like, is it really a problem or is it just people that are just trying to compete? And the way I, the reason why I say that is because when we work with our clients, we always tell them, look, here's what you're approved for. Just because you're approved for this amount doesn't mean you need to go up to yeah. this amount. But put your best offer forward. Always put your best offer forward yeah. so that you have the best chance. You know that, look, I'm going in. This is my max budget. I'm comfortable with it. If it goes over that, maybe you walk away. Maybe you don't. Yeah. Like ultimately, at the end of the day, you have to be comfortable. Because right now, with all these things that are happening, so many people are feeling discouraged Yeah. when they're putting in their offer and they're getting rejected because now they need to go into firm offers. This is something that's happening again. Like, yeah. We always tell yeah. her, we tell her clients back in November, October of 2023, November, when rates were a little bit higher, the market was a lot quieter. I was reaching out to some of our clients saying, now's the time. Like now's, now's that opportunity. Yes. Interest rates are a little bit higher, but as we say, marry the price of the home, date the rate because the rate can change you, especially for clients that needed a conditional finance. Yeah. There's because a lot of, a lot of individuals is working with all kinds of, some of them have help from their parents. They're putting down five, 400 grand, 300 grand, 500 grand. They sold a home for multiple millions and they're, they're able to buy another home. They don't maybe need a mortgage for a very small mortgage. They qualify for three times that. Yeah. So they don't need to have a condition of finance. But that young buyer, that first time buyer that's getting into the market who's saying, I'm limping in with 20% or whatever the amount is. I, I can't afford much more than that. They're going to lose out. Yeah. And they had the, I think they had the opportunity and now, unfortunately, I think with all these multiple offers, this is the call we're getting from the agent saying, and I need my client to go firm. What can we do? And I'm like, well, they need to have a co-signer. Yeah. They need to have more backup. They need to have, you know, what happens if the appraisal doesn't come in? Because right now, as this market shifts, you can probably test this and I'll throw it back to you is as we see these homes slowly, you know, that home got 10 grand more. Now that home got yeah. 15 grand more. That home got 50 grand more the appraisal the banks everything is lagging there's always this yeah. lag in that and, and and tell me what are you seeing happening there like with the home prices so yeah. so before we do that 
<clears throat> one thing that has to be addressed is if I'm your customer, mm -hmm. okay, so if I'm the outside customer listening in on what you just said, and I'm going to start with you, Anthony Conte, and I'm going to say, how do you approach your client in an educated form uh, to ensure that they understand the intricate details of both the real estate market and the mortgage process? So hearing what Anth just said and understanding that now you need to be an educator of your particular field, how do you navigate that? Yeah, so the biggest thing is I think working hand in hand with their mortgage agent, I think it's very important because if I know what they're pre-approved for, I already have in the back of my mind knowing when I'm going in through, let's say, negotiation or stuff like that, I know what our bottom line price is and what our maximum price is, right? So what I think is it's very important when you're kind of dealing with a situation like this to, to do your homework as a realtor and make sure you're well prepared. Look at the comparables. Look at what else is, is happening to similar properties because like you just said, the appraisals, yeah, it may, may take a little bit of a lag, but if that appraisal comes in and, and let's say it, it's well over or well short of what you're, you're offering, you're going to have to come up with that extra cash. I don't think nobody wants to come up with an extra 100, 200,000 cash just to, you know, because your, your, your mortgage isn't going to cover it. Right. So as a realtor, I think it is very, very important that you do your homework, your due diligence um, in in looking at these properties, because then your, our clients, our, our job is to educate them. Right. If we can't educate them properly and they're going to be left with, you know, potentially having to come up with an extra couple hundred thousand if the appraisal comes in. Right. You, you nailed it. And I think that's that's really an interesting point, because as an agent, as a broker, our job isn't to just get them home. And that's it because we're putting a lot of work, a lot of effort into closing the transaction. Remember, we don't want to go through this whole process only to lose out on the appraisal yeah. and have a deal <clears throat> collapse right in front of us. So when we're working with our clients, we're trying to do all that. Like we're looking, we're reaching out to the agent saying, hey, give me the comparables. Uh, what are our chances of this property not coming in? How comfortable are you? Right. And you, and you touched upon like the backup. Like if, what happens if that appraisal doesn't come in? We've, we've had this happen mostly with a lot of new construction uh, that, you know, obviously some prices have been adjusted. A lot of people that did upgrades, you know, they're not getting those valuations, but do they have that backup? What's their lifeline? What's, what's their support mechanism behind the scenes? Some people don't have it. And that's literally why we're telling clients, you can't go into a firm offer. And if you are going into a firm offer, it's at your own peril. It's yeah, at your own right. risk to do that. But by the time they get to you, isn't it already too late? No, not necessarily. I mean, like this is where we have to sort of turn everything over. I back in the day it was always talk to a realtor, then go get your mortgage financing. I think today it's having that synergy to say, let me get pre-approved first. Let me find out what my maximum amount is that I can buy for. And then, you know, then reach out to the agent saying, I'm pre-approved. This is my this is my limit. But I think a lot of people are hesitant. Like we talk to a lot of clients. And I'm like, I'm your friend. I'm your broker. Uh, I'm not here to you know screw you over. I, I need to know what you're working with from everything. Tell me everything. Lay out the cards. I'm not going to go back and report to the bank. You know, like you, you have more money, but you're only putting this. I yeah. need to know this so that I can guide you and say, okay, you're prepared that if this property comes in, you do have this backup. I'm not there to, oh, but we want to keep that as a slush fund. Yes, absolutely. But that slush fund, you're telling me you got 50, 60, 70 K in backup not including your down payment or closing costs. Now I know saying, okay, you have this. If the property doesn't valuate, you have this backup. It's your choice now whether you want to execute on using those backup funds or not. It's literally educating the client saying, what are your options? Because my goal is to get you a home. That's it. Same goal. Yeah. We have the same. Yeah. We're, we're, we're just trying to get you home at the best possible rate, best possible product. We're just trying to match everything, get that synergy. And if people don't, if clients don't explain, like, like tell us what's happening we can't advise properly we, we just can't it's like going into a, a, your, your strategy saying hey my appetite for risk is very low i don't like risk guess what i don't think you should go into variable maybe but with with the home prices did they really come off as much as many had thought because i think a lot of our clients were waiting yeah. for this massive correction this this huge 20 30 percent change and although some markets I did see, like those outskirt markets, uh, change big big numbers, like 20%, 25%. GTA, some of those homes, the desirable ones, the ones that are well-appointed, 
close to good schools, transport, uh, transportation. So did they really correct that much? Yeah, you, you pretty much nailed it. It is very property dependent, I would say, right? Like, you know, the, the in demand, the, the more I would say between, let's say, million bucks to to you know one five one six one seven those those still remain pretty pretty strong they didn't drop as significantly as people thought right um i would say the bigger the bigger homes too uh they did drop in value um just because obviously that that window that that market dwindled right because there's not that many buyers that exactly, can afford exactly where we probably saw the you know, a big change was probably under a million dollars. And those were the properties that, you know, they're longer on the market. They're not moving as quickly. Those are the ones that these first time home buyers would be looking at. And if these rates are so high, the first time home buyers, they weren't able to come into the market. Mm -hmm. So what we did see was 100 days, 200 days, 300 days on the market for some of these properties and a lot of price changes that I saw a lot of price changes on a lot of these properties. Um, and that's that's kind of where we saw the biggest shift in the market, I would say. Yeah, I mean, as the market began to shift, like I think we see all these these homes, these first homes for clients. And one thing that we're noticing right now, actually, just to, to think about, like it's not even the. I think that for us, at least in our our book of business, where we are, the condo market slowed down a little yeah. bit. I mean, not that it's not busy elsewhere, but. A lot of our buyers are looking at homes. They're looking at that town, that semi, that detached, that entry level one single car garage. Because I personally think, and this is my opinion, they're not going to be building detached homes. I think they're going to go into more high density, uh, more affordable. But like I think a lot of people are seeing that writing on the wall. This is what I'm getting from my clients. Yeah. And this is what we're seeing with the lack of, you know, I don't want to get into the government talk, but obviously the accelerator fund did nothing. Um, you know, they're trying to build all these homes. They're trying to basically get the market shifted uh, to start building. But builders aren't building. Condos are going into receivership. Uh, these projects. Uh, rates are too high. Cost for acquiring money, acquisition for financing is, is astronomical. So builders aren't building. We're kicking this can down the road. And if we start to see that, I don't think builders are going to start building single detached home because the price point's too high. Yeah. So now, ultimately... If we see this single detached home, is it going to be like this ultimate luxury home? Like I think about it and say, well, we bought 10 years ago, for an example, right? We bought a single car detached home. That was what we called a starter home. Yeah. Right? But that was 10 years ago. 10 years ago. But 10 years ago, so you're, how old are you, Ant? Uh, 25. So for a 25-year-old now in 2024, that's a, a... Forever home. That's a forever dream home that technically so in your market in your age demographic yeah. now what are you guys doing unfortunately you're not getting that that dream home starter home like our parents did you know where mm -hmm. it was you two bedroom uh, sorry four bedroom you know two car garage for under 300,000 that's not happening anymore unfortunately now my generation you're looking at the entry point what's the bottom line price i can enter the market in and it's condos and, and that's but what's that entry level price point guys it's yeah upwards of seven plus, plus six. no six yeah it depends it de literally depends. It depends on the it area depends and on everything. the area uh it, it, and from my experience like i said this is a good this is a good yeah. conversation i'm really glad you brought this up because the age does change yeah so i want to preface this by saying something Every generation looks at the one before and says, wow, like I'll look at friends like we got married in our 30s. OK, yeah, I'll use myself as an example. And I looked at people that got married maybe a couple years before us and they're like, oh, they bought this beautiful home. And I'm like, wow, two car garage and that, 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 right. And I'm sitting there saying, well, that was a, that was a time, right? They, they did their life cycle when they're, they were doing their finances. Everything was cheaper, right? I get it. But as we move forward now, someone's going to look at us and say, oh, this guy's 40. Look at the house that he's living in. It, it's all changing. Like I see what you're saying and that's, and that's the reality is, is like you were saying about your, can you find a single car detached home that's going to be your forever home? And is it the right call? Like, I think that's the other thing too, for a lot of first time home buyers, are you, we all want what our parents have. Okay? Yeah. Right. Of course. Our parents worked a lifetime to get where they are. Yes. They were fortunate. Home prices definitely were much cheaper. Expenses were a lot but less. Not really though, because they were also earning like $7 an hour. 
Yes, but they didn't. Okay, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that interest rates. You know, I'm going to sit here and say, okay, interest rates were at 20. percent But they were 20 percent though. I was born in 82. My parents were literally paying 19 to 20 percent for interest, which cost them a lot of money. They weren't even making that much money at the time. What was the interest rate back when our parents were buying? Was it 18 uh, percent? Something crazy. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, we saw it spike, come back down, go back up. But again. it was it was 15 to 18 percent based on a. Sixty thousand dollar home. Sixty, eighty. And now, it, it, now we're talking five percent on a million and a half. Right. And as I said, I'm not going to sit here and say that they had a better time or worse time because ultimately, back then, I think the dynamics were much different. They didn't have uh, Spotify. They didn't have YouTube. They didn't have car leases. They didn't have gym memberships. There was a lot of different. Yeah. There was a huge difference in that mentality. I think today, and I'm going to say this, is we're as a younger generation, I as a I look at myself and say, I'm experience based. I want to live a good life. I want to travel. I want to go to good restaurants. I want to enjoy my life. Coming from a European background, our parents were much different. They were tightening their belt. They weren't going out. They were never ordering. We didn't have skip the dishes in Uber. <laughs> Are you kidding? My grandfather would probably roll in his grave right now if he saw my Uber Eats and skip the dishes bill. So, you know, we're looking at a different mindset. Today, people are looking at the mortgage differently. And I think that's the mindset that when I explain to a client, so 25 or 30 year amortization, they know that they're going to have that mortgage for that long. Like it's, 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 a, it's a for sure mindset. It's a for sure mindset. Our parents were able to knock out a mortgage in a lot shorter time because yes, the mortgage was smaller. Interest rates were not as high. But I think it has a lot to do with the mindset, right? Yeah. So now let's touch on the mindset with you being at your age with your girlfriend and you're yes. both looking to evolve and have your own home and such and so forth. This discussion that you are personally having, if you had to put yourself in the consumer's point of view, how are you having this discussion? Where are your avenues and how do you see yourself owning a home? Yeah, well, it's not, you know, it's, it's a lot different. It is a lot different because just going back to, let's say, how our parents did it by 25, 26, you know, they were already married, maybe had kids and, and, you know, they already own their home, right? For us, it's a lot different, right? People I'm, I'm seeing people are getting married a lot later, you know, people are purchasing their first property a lot later. And honestly, I think that's kind of where this new generation, that's kind of the way things are shifting because it's not affordable like it was back then, right? People my generation, they're not going out and splashing, uh, you know, a million dollar, you know, properties, like that's not what's happening. Right. So ideally it's, it's being shifted down the road right now. We have the luxury. My parents aren't kicking me out mm -hmm. anytime soon. So obviously I'm going to be sitting at home, you know, working, making money, saving, saving, saving until it is time to, to purchase, you know, my first property, uh, which at, at the way things are going, it's turning out, it's going to be, you know, maybe a, a condo, a townhouse, a, a semi, right. Not like before, which it was mm -hmm. detached, single car garage, you know. And I think I think you bring up a really good point, Anthony. It's like when we we did it, obviously times were different. I remember buying my, my my first home, our first property, and as I said, I have no problem sharing it. Like it was two hundred forty five thousand dollars, right? Yeah. The first first property we bought, and the idea is is that we just wanted to get into the market. Yeah. Right. The, the idea was is I didn't want to buy that forever home. I wanted to work my way up the property ladder. Is there a disconnect between people that are saying, I don't want to get in at a small point. I just want to save till I can get to the big point. Or should they be starting off small, like going into a condo, yeah. getting acquainted with home ownership, yeah, yeah. what it takes to pay a mortgage. And at least they're paying, you know, something per month and, and saving. I think I want to touch on those two things. I think it's really important. A lot of the clients who work with the younger generation in your age group, they are saving. Like I, my generation, maybe they did save. We we blew a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so because we were living at home, European Italians. Yeah, we stayed yeah. home. My parents weren't kicking me out. It was no cost. But you know, my parents said you should buy a house, and I'm like, what am I going to do with a house at 20 years old? You know, we our mindset wasn't yeah wasn't like that. So we were we were trying to save, but my parents said get in here, start small. We were able to start there, and that that was a jump off point to the next home. Yeah, we took the equity, bought. Boom. And now finally we're in our forever home. Yeah. You, right? you, you just nailed in. it. Yeah. You nailed it. Yeah. Build up the equity. That's, that's looking at it from the business point of point of view now. And what I would tell my first time home buyer customers and, you know, friends and colleagues and stuff like that, start off small. Who cares if it's a one bedroom condo or 500 square feet? Who cares? You're building up equity, 
right? I'm sure you can, you're not going to move out into that property right now. So why not rent it out, have it pay off itself, build your equity, because like you just said, then you move up the, the property ladder, you get to your next step. And by then, you know, you at least have all that equity built up already. And you've gone through property ownership, you've gone through having to pay your, you know, property taxes and, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? So I think buying property teaches you to buy, like, I mean, I'm not saying that people don't own a budget, but most people don't live in a spreadsheet, like in the sense of, you know, they're looking at the micro macroeconomics, they're looking at, okay, can I afford to buy it? You mentioned about renting it out too. Like, sometimes we're talking to a lot of buyers and stuff like that. And helping them to sort of say okay yeah buy a property ultimately at the end of the day you can always rent it out but obviously cash flows right now if you're yeah. buying with a higher interest rate yeah. are they gonna are they gonna cash flow but ultimately like you said if they're living at home and they're not having any really real expenses yeah maybe they're short falling let's call it a thousand bucks a month between two people a lot of our a lot of our clients they're not always single they're you know maybe looking to get married they're getting engaged they're looking to start that journey and ultimately things work with the budget that you have get into the market that's that's there is it that's worked for me uh over the last little while it can't it, as i said is the market going to do one thing the last couple of years have taught us no we've had a really good yeah. bull run yeah now the volatility kicks in but ultimately i think it's like any investment the longer you're in if you're if you're looking to buy something for short term the volatility the exposure to risk is great but if you're saying look i need a place to live rather than pay exorbitant rents i'd rather pay down my mortgage pay down the rent. Yes, there's condo fees. Yes, there's property taxes. But ultimately, it's a life lesson. You're you're actually starting to budget saying, okay, I used to go out to nightclubs and go to these restaurants. Now, you know, instead of doing it once a week, we're going to do it once a month. It's going to teach you responsibility. Yeah. And that my mom, my parents always taught us that. And that's one thing I've learned in the finance industry is good debt. I believe a mortgage is a good debt. You can agree or disagree with me on that, but it gives you footings and groundings. And especially as entrepreneurs, you want to yeah. work hard and try to pay off that mortgage. And, and what I'll say as we approach 40 minutes, gentlemen, as we approach 40 minutes, with you, and the fact that you're in the, the race of real estate and understanding where the markets are going, um, how the houses are still now becoming, we're going back into the bidding wars and all that. When it comes to bidding wars, now, bidding wars taught us one very important thing. The market isn't what it used to be it used to be very controlled this is what the house is valued at it may go a little higher may go a little lower but then people started over budgeting over asking and then it, it got killed by covid now everyone is quote unquote in a bidding war but it's not even at market level yet so see we lost three hundred thousand during covid now people are saying well i'm going to put on the market for 800 it now went fifty thousand over asking but the value is really 900. So how do you educate your new clients and say, wait a second, it's not that you're overpaying, it's that you're now getting close back to the market value. Yeah, I think it's it's all back to this education, this education perspective, that's the most important, right? Because first time home buyers um, who, let's say they've never talked to a mortgage agent, they've never talked to a realtor, you know, you maybe just look on, online, realtor.ca, you see all these prices. It can be very, very scary. You know what I mean? Especially hearing all these stories from, you know, the old times when, oh, uh, all these homes used to be this much, uh, you know, these bigger homes were a lot cheaper, right? Now, when you're looking at things, if you don't have that kind of help through a realtor or a mortgage agent, I don't know a lot of these people go directly to, let's say, the listing agent selling a seller agent, right? Because at the end of the day, you want someone who's going to work in your best interest, right? And that's what I think a mortgage agent and a realtor does. So the way I would educate my clients is, is this. When the price is set at, you know, a million bucks and you know it's going to be a bidding war, educate them on that. Let them know that, hey, listen, this is where the property used to be. This is where they're aiming for now. Come to an agreement in the middle, right? Because I think if you're going to overshoot and let's say you do overpay, you never know what tomorrow is going to bring, right? Look what happened to a lot of people, like you said, in March 2022, April 2022, when they bought at the peak. What happened a couple months later? Home prices started to correct. And this is this is ultimately the idea is bringing that conversation to the forefront not being a paper pusher actually sitting down taking that value that time as as brokers the one thing we 
at least myself, I can speak to so not all agents are the yeah. same. A lot of people are just there to chase a paycheck. And this comes down to a few different things. One, interview your broker, interview your real estate agent. Find out ultimately, you know, if you guys are compatible. Number one, are, do, do they meet or check off your boxes? And two, what type of value are they bringing to the table? Like you said, I don't, as a realtor, you don't want, as a mortgage agent, I don't want my client to not, to, to overpay for a house. I don't want to sell them on a product that they can't afford. There's been times where we're working with a client, I'm like, you can't go here. Like, even if you think you can, the numbers are saying otherwise. Case in point, let me explain this. And, and even for some people in different generations, let's add a co-signer to the deal. Great. Deal looks fantastic. The banks love it because mom and papa are on the deal. But who's making the mortgage payment? Who is mom and dad paying your mortgage? Because ultimately we're making the deal work or service with that additional support, but they're not making the payment. So ultimately you're buying this home and now all of a sudden you don't have this additional income. You're behind the eight ball because one little expense that pops up or one thing that you need to change or your car breaks down and you're ultimately this leads to them having to incur debt. And we've talked about this before. It's there's two servicing numbers when you're qualifying for a mortgage, what the bank approves you for in the sense of your pre-tax or after tax money versus your pre-tax money. So you're making a hundred grand. The bank's using a hundred grand. They're not taking the 20 points off and saying, Hey, you're only coming home with 80. They're using a hundred. You're already 20 grand behind the ball right now. So when you go to add that number in, your ratios go from one point to another. And then you wonder why people are getting in debt or why they're they're finding these problems. So it's educating the client saying, are you guys comfortable with this? What, do you have a side hustle? Oh, I make cash money. Okay, we can't use the cash, but I know, you know that this money stream is coming in or you have these support mechanisms or you have this extra money. That should be guiding the principal. There was a time back in 2021, 2020, where we were stretching that budget. How much more can I get? Now it's like, Ant, I know I can qualify for that, but I want to pull in a little bit. I don't want my mortgage payments to be that high. I need to buffer. And I think that market changes. Correct me if I'm wrong. I th- yeah, no, you're, you're right. Yeah, it, it does. It does vary, right? Um, with the whole change in, in markets, like you just said, you said earlier, we go through different markets. I think within the last year, we've, we've maybe seen two or three markets. Now we're starting to see yet another market as we head into the summer, right? So when, when, you're, when you're looking through that, when you're balancing out, hey, how much can I afford? Do you think I could stretch it a little bit more? I think now you're going to slowly start to see back what we had before when people were trying to stretch a little bit more just so they can get the property, right? And that you know better than I do, but that's where, you know, your mortgage agent's got to tell you, Hey, listen, I don't know if it's a good idea or, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe we can do it, you know, knowing you do have that extra cash coming in. Right. So it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in this next market. Let's say. I, I totally agree with you. And we'll, we'll round things out with two questions. Number one, do you think we're in a seller's market? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. So seller's market, I, don't think we're fully there yet. I think we're going to be. We're getting there. Uh, we're just, I believe, within the last, let's say, January till now, mm-hmm. I believe we're right at the end of that that buyer's market. But, you know, every day I keep going on my, you know, my MLS system and I keep saying bidding war, over asking, over asking. It's starting to make me think that the seller market's coming back. And number two, what advice would you give to somebody at your age who's looking to get into the market? All right. So what I would say is if you do have that luxury of, you know, being able to save and stay at home, I I would say look into potentially getting your first property. I I would kind of deter you away from renting if you could, if you could stay at home and, you know, you don't have to worry about paying for rent. Maybe look into getting into that first property. Start building up your equity. Have that property work for you in the sense that, you know, rent it out, build up your income, you know, have it paid for. Right. Because we're not able to buy that that dream home like we've said many times. We're not able to do that anymore. You're going to have to work your way up the property ladder, okay? Start off small, get into something small, condo, something like that, and work your way up. Build up your equity, and that's I what I would say. Time, time duration, and last thing, last, last thing that I want to ask is, what do you think is going to happen in the next little month? Let's say if we had to predict right now, no one's holding you to it, yeah. but just based on what you were saying, looking at the MLS, based on the trajectory of the market right now, do you think we're going to see a lot more inventory? Do you think we're going to see home prices escalate? Yeah, I, I think you're going to start to see uh, prices are going to start to to go up. How much up? That nobody knows. We, yeah, no one knows. But 
the way things are heading, especially going into the spring. Spring's usually strong. Leading up to that, you know, big Bank of Canada announcement of a, a rate, you know, rate decrease. I do think you're going to start to see prices start to, to awesome. go back up. And where can they find you on social media? Uh, you can find me at Anthony Conte uh, Real Estate uh, on Instagram and uh, LinkedIn everywhere. At and Facebook. let's plug who's the uh, what's the real estate broker? Remax at uh, Remax West uh, here in Kleinberg in the village. Awesome, so, right down the street from us. And you street. can obviously find us on Instagram at a uh, underscore Venuto or at In Touch Mortgages on our website and our YouTube channel. But thanks again, Anth, for joining us today. Great conversation. We'll see you next time. Thanks for having me. Let's go. Good job.